I'm a neurosurgeon with the Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you to WeSpeak. WeSpeak is a live online video journal club. With WeSpeak, we are striving to make research more accessible, transparent, and collaborative. Through WeSpeak, authors can authors of published research discuss their work not only with a panel of their peers, but also with the general public. If you're new to We Speak, you can interact with our presenters live in several ways. No matter how you're watching the live broadcast, you can tweet your question or comment using the hashtag We Speak. If you have a Google Plus account, you can join our Hangout on Air on the UMBTC Google Plus page and use the live question and answer feature. If you're watching on the We Speak Live page from our website, you can post questions and comments in a blog format. You can also watch the broadcast on the UMBTC YouTube page. All We Speak presentations will be archived on our website and our YouTube page. At the end of the presentation, please take a moment to complete a satisfaction survey and help us improve. The link to the survey is available on the We Speak Live page. The Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center is a partnership between Northern Michigan University and Marquette General Hospital. We are also excited to be working with research.org, a leader in crowdfunding of medical research. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. John Lawrence and Nicholas Cook. Hi, I'm, I'm John Lawrence. I joined uh, the Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center in 2009. I was the center's first postdoctoral research fellow. I studied here at NMU as both an undergraduate and a graduate student. From here I went north to Michigan Tech where I completed my PhD in integrative physiology studying the effects of female gonadal hormones on sympathetic nerve activity. Since joining the Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center's lab, uh, my research interests have changed. My basic science interests include the influence of hormones and the role of the autonomic nervous system in brain tumorigenesis. And my clinical interests include palliative care and alternative medicine, specifically environmental enrichment, neuroplasticity, and exercise on the cancer patient's quality of life. And my name is Nicholas Cook. Um, I am a graduate student with the Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center here at Northern Michigan University. I did my undergraduate at Northern, and um, I'd like to thank Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Rovin for their introductions and making this possible. Uh, well, let's move this over to our PowerPoint. So today we will be discussing a research publication written on leptin promoting glioblastoma. It's the title of our research publication. Dr. Lawrence was the first author and I was the second author on this. This was with Neurological Research International Journal. I would also like to thank uh, the researchers, both graduate and undergraduate, that I've worked with during my college career, both graduate and undergraduate here, work with the Brain Tumor Center, and making this the most enjoyable part of my college career. The topics of today's talk will be glioblastoma, what that actually is, leptin, both the normal function and how it will function in cancer, and the final topic will be environmental enrichment. So what is glioblastoma? Glioblastoma is one of the most common forms of a primary brain tumor, and it's also unfortunately the most aggressive tumor. 
prognosis for GBM is dismal, even with the gold standard of care. Surgical resection and chemotherapy. The average one-year prognosis from 1995 to 2009 was 35%, which is very poor when you compare that to other cancers. So part of the reason behind this poor prognosis is that tumor recurring or that tumor coming back. And so this prompted our organization to look at a different treatment option for glioblastoma. This brings us to my second topic, which is a focus of mine in the Brain Tumor Center, which is leptin. So many of you may have heard of leptin before, and it was probably related to hunger. Leptin was discovered as a hormone that signals satiety, or that feeling of fullness you get after a meal. And this was first discovered by Jeffrey Friedman in the early 1990s in mice. So mice found to be deficient in leptin had this very obese phenotype, which is the physical appearance. And that would be the mouse on the left. And these mice, when they were given exogenous leptin, or leptin added to their diet, they returned to a normal weight. This is the mouse on the right. Both of these mice have the same genetic mutation where they lack leptin. And for this reason, the leptin gene was referred to as OB or obese. And you'll occasionally see that abbreviation throughout this paper, throughout this presentation. So despite leptin being the wonder drug and obesity for rodents, the effects are not the same in humans. Overall, our obesity does not result from a lack of leptin, but in fact the opposite. So obese humans have leptin, and they actually produce too much leptin. As obese individuals have higher concentrations of adipose tissue or fat cells, they also produce more leptin main production site. Well, this makes sense as leptin is a satiety signal. So the more fat you have, the more stored energy you have. However, as your leptin levels climb, they'll reach a level of resistance. And at this level of resistance, no additional leptin will have any effect on weight loss or appetite. And we'll come back to this topic later of how we can reduce these heightened levels of leptin. One of the first indications that leptin had a role in cancer was that, in general, obesity was related to increases in certain types of cancer. One of the earliest studies linking leptin specifically to brain tumors with the finding of a heightened level of leptin receptor and leptin ligand. So the leptin that's actually secreted, brain tumor, which increased with the malignancy. So this meant that a low-grade astrocytoma, which you're seeing the second from the left, has considerably less leptin and its receptor than a glioblastoma which you can see on your right. OBR being the left hand side. So this figure uses immunohistochemistry, which is the use of antibodies to detect the proteins leptin and leptin receptor. And we're looking at all three grades of brain tumor. So these grades are grade two tumors, which are also astrocytoma, or grade astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma. We have grade 3 tumors, which is our anaplastic astrocytoma. And in the grade 4 is only the glioblast. So this study was able to use this immunohistochemistry to score these tumor samples. And the results were actually quite amazing. As you can see here, the leptin positive samples increased to 80% in glioblastoma. 
you compare this to the 25% in the grade 2 category of brain tumor, this is a big difference. A similar trend happens with leptin receptor for the older guard. You see this increasing with malignancy. So from this data, we know leptin is widespread and weak to blastoma. But what does it do? So here we have table one from our review, where we based our analysis on 84 publications, many of which were primary literature and some reviews about the effects of leptin in different forms of cancer. These effects vary between cancers, although there are several similarities. You can see this with breast and colon cancer. So that you don't have to look at this, our table and figure out what exactly the effects are based on each cancer. You narrow down the effects to these four key areas. We included the associated cellular pathways, which we won't get into today. So the proliferation, first key area that you see there. Angiogenesis, migration, and anti-apoptosis. That's four areas that we broke this down to. To help you understand exactly what the leptin is doing, I will explain these terms further. So proliferation is the increased or out of control growth most people associate with cancer. As the tumor grows, it needs an enhanced blood supply to provide nutrients and remove waste. An hypoxic condition is the lack of oxygen. This will result from the outgrowing blood supply. So once that tumor continues to grow, it won't have the blood supply it needs. So leptin levels will actually increase along with other angiogenic factors this blood supply. Another angiogenic factor like leptin is VEGF, which stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. A link between these two angiogenic factors has been found in many cancers, as leptin actually increases VEGF levels. This will result in an overall vascularized. Then we have metastasis or migration. So migration, excuse me, metastasis is not often observed in brain tumors. However, we can see migration. This can be observed through tumor recurrence in areas outside of the primary tumor. And in other forms of cancer, like colon cancer, where metastasis occurs, you can see leptin having an effect by promoting tumor invasion into the surrounding tissues. Final effect we have here is anti-apoptosis, which put simply is an avoidance of cell death. Normally cells undergo a controlled cell death after a set number of cell divisions. Cancer cells, however, will continue to divide and grow. This is called them being immortal. So in this context, leptin has been found to assist in evading that normal cell death path. At the time of this review, there were a few studies that were on glioblastoma and leptin. One of the common uses of studying glioblastoma and leptin was using a rat glioblastoma cell line named C6. With this rat cell line, the expression for leptin was silent. Using a small interfering RNA. When this leptin was silenced, 
their increased cell death. At this point, it lessens effect on avoiding apoptosis in glioblastoma. Another study with rat C6 cells looking at adding leptin or exogenous leptin, which increased a matrix metalloproteinase, MMP13, another name for this. And this family of proteins helps to break down extracellular matrix. So this extracellular matrix is going to hold certain tissue types together, hold organs together. So this will allow for an increased tissue invasion with this increased MMP13. So now we know some of the effects of leptin. Now we're going to look at what we can do to reduce these leptin levels. This is our final section of our discussion today on environmental enrichment. For our purposes, we will be breaking stressors into two different categories, eustress and distress. Eustress, also known as good stress, you can think of this as activities you enjoy. Give you a general sense of well-being, like going outside on a nice day, exercising, being having social time with your friends. Distress, you can think of as a bad stressor like unwanted social isolation or worrying about that test you have next week. These conditions are very easy to test. Rodent model with environmental enrichment, we use things like exercise equipment and social housing. You can see this from an image from Dr. Chow on the left. And this is compared to how we normally house laboratory animals, the, the cage system on your right. They're housed by themselves without any type of enrichment in that environment. Now we can look at what that environmental enrichment does. So, with that environmental enrichment, you have an increase in use stress and a decrease in distress or the bad stress. This difference in the types of stress can be seen with disease progression. These effects have been observed in many neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's and Alzheimer's, as well as in different forms of cancer. A groundbreaking study by Barbara Anderson examined the effects of psychological intervention for being involved in a support group for cancer survivors with breast cancer. This study found environmental enrichment actually slowed cancer progression and could slow tumor recurrence. The mechanism for how this physiologically happens was partially mapped out in that animal model that I had talked about earlier. A study by Dr. Chow, their colleague, found the connection with leptin where environmentally enriched mice were given melanoma. The enriched mice had their melanoma growing at a slower rate, and in some cases, melanoma went into remission. With this study, they found increased levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This, in turn, would act on sympathetic nerves to reduce leptin levels. This, you can see, explained from a figure from that publication. At the time of this review, we had little known about glioblastoma outside of that rat cell line. Also, 
if sympathetic stimulation could play a role in decreasing leptin in glioblastin. We are currently investigating the effects of leptin in glioblastoma as a viable supplemental treatment for the future. That gives you a general background on our review. I would time we will take any questions. Okay, well, I have a question uh, for both John and Nick. Uh, as uh, we know with uh, our, our We Speak lectures, we hope to uh, engage a number of high school students, undergraduate students who are interested in uh, uh, careers in science, for example, and uh, may be curious about what motivates uh, scientific research. So if John and then Nick could comment on uh, what uh, was your inspiration, so to speak, for this particular uh, line of investigation? I can I can start on that first. <clears throat> Specifically, uh, this particular topic uh, started with uh, the, the background that I had through my training. As a pre-doctoral student uh, and a doctoral student, I was trained as an applied and integrative physiologist. And before I joined the lab, I really was focusing on the neural regulation of autonomic control, or more simply, I was investigating different maneuvers that are known to excite the sympathetic nervous system and how various treatments could alter the sympathetic nerve signals. Uh, it was this background in the autonomic nervous system and in the recent reports of stress reduction and better prognoses that led to our lab's interest in leptin. Uh, we really uh, were interested in this uh, use stress, distress phenomenon and how uh, a good stressor could augment the sympathetic signals to fat cells or adipocytes and how this adrenergic signaling could reduce the leptin secretion uh, leading to a reduction in leptin circulation and uh, less tumor growth. Uh, and that's where that's where those direct interests came from. Uh, but in terms of just research in general to a high school student or um, anyone interested in science in general, it was uh, it was early in, early on in my college career when I got an opportunity to do research in a lab under my advisor, Dr. Randy Randy Jensen. And it was this uh, undergraduate research experience that really stemmed uh, my career in tertiary education and to pursue uh, a career in research. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the lab. I thought it was like go to the to the lab and build something new every day and uh, try to answer a new question. I kind of uh, got really excited about that. And so uh, two s completely different answers for that uh, question, but uh, and that's why I do what I do now. So do you have anything to add, Nick? Um, well, I started with this as a uh, freshman fellow with the Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center. And I was starting at the same time as Dr. Lawrence was starting his postdoc. And so really, as a freshman coming in, any idea sounds really good. And as I started looking more about uh, things like positive psychology, related to this, I was really wondering what actually was happening uh, physiologically. So that kind of sparked my interest. Uh, for those of you uh, watching live, feel free to uh, ask a question uh, or tweet us. Uh, remember, just use the hashtag we speak, and we will be able to see your question. Uh, we do have a question that just came in. And again, uh, for both uh, uh, John and Nick, and that is, uh, in general, do you see more cancer in obese patients? Do you want Do you want to try a stab at that, Nick? Yeah, I can try. Uh, so now, with brain tumors, we don't see this increase in cancer with obese patients, at least not 
from what we see in the UP. However, with uh, this is more common with certain types of cancers, uh, breast cancer. A lot of the work that has been done on leptin has been done on breast cancer. So it, it depends very much on what type of cancer. Yeah, I think that uh, over the past several decades, the percentage of overweight and obese adults and, and children uh, have really increased uh, significantly. And there is a, a clear association with the increased risk of cancers. And some of these cancers include the esophagus, breast, uh, the lining of the uterus, the endometrium cancer, uh, the colon and rectum, kidney, pancreas, thyroid, gallbladder, and, and possibly a lot of other types. Now, in terms of brain tumor, there has not been any clear association between malignancy uh, and, and obesity. However, uh, there has been a clear indication that uh, as the tumor becomes more malignant, uh, and more more leptin and more ligand, more leptin receptor and more ligand become available uh, and can act as a growth factor uh, within within this type of tumor. Okay, um, again for both uh, John and Nick, do you have some uh, preliminary data from our lab regarding uh, the influence of leptin on the growth of uh, these glioblastoma cells in culture? Yes, we do. Uh, we have actually gone to two uh, Society for Neuro-Oncology conferences uh, with uh, posters for our data, looking at reducing leptin and what effect that has on cell viability. Uh, we are looking at established GBM cell lines, which are going to be uh, forming the bulk of the tumor. And so with, uh, by decreasing the amount of leptin, we were able to decrease cell viability. There's also, uh, uh, Dr. Rovin, new evidence uh, coming out even just this year, not necessarily in GBM, but in other cancers known to be uh, uh, correlated with obesity, but such as colorectal cancer. Uh, they're actually detecting uh, serum um, leptin in patients and, uh, and uh, looking at um, leptin receptor uh, messenger RNA expression in these patients as well. Okay, excellent. Um, we'll stay here for another few minutes uh, waiting uh, for some questions uh, online. Again, uh, if you're uh, viewing us live, feel free to tweet a question or comment uh, with the hashtag we speak. Uh, if you're watching us on Google Plus, We'll be able to use the live question and answer feature uh, and type in your question. We'll be able to see it. Uh, you can also um, post a question on our We Speak Live page on our website, and we will be able to see that as well. Uh, so um, as we uh, get ready to wrap up, um, any uh, any final thoughts, uh, gentlemen? Uh, Share either about the uh, We Speak format or about the uh, research uh, that you're doing in general. Uh, I'll add a couple of things in terms of this uh, We Speak format. I, I'm really excited that uh, one of our papers was chosen first to to uh, to share with the global community, and I'm looking uh, really forward to uh, inviting. Uh, researchers uh, from around the country and the globe to uh, to join us live and on air and to talk about uh, the research with with our lab with our students with people around um, on the internet as well as uh, as potential uh, high, you know future scientists from high school or even undergraduates that want to participate in in these discussions. Uh, Nick, any final thoughts? So I went from my undergraduate working with leptin, and 
and now as a graduate student, I'm continuing that same research, uh, related research on with that left in uh, my thesis. So, yeah, I've been working with this project for this is the fifth year. Have made a lot of headway, and uh, hopefully, are gaining a better understanding. Thanks. Well. Uh, for me, I think this is a, a great start. The format, I think, works well. Uh, we hope that uh, folks that have uh, joined us live will continue to uh, uh, join us for future events. Uh, we are planning our next event for uh, sometime during the last week of October. That coincides with a Brain Tumor Awareness Week. Uh, and on campus here at Northern Michigan University, we traditionally hold a series of evening lectures. So this year we hope to uh, incorporate a We Speak uh, Live Online Journal Club, uh, which will be very exciting. And uh, certainly we'll uh, hope that you can tune in. We will keep you posted. You can find out more information on our website, our Facebook page, uh, and so forth. So again, I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to Dr. John Lawrence and to Nick Cook for taking the time to share with our audience their research on leptin and glioblastoma. And we hope to uh, see you the next time uh, with We Speak. Uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs>